it is well with my soul. Is it well with yours? I'd like to thank the <clears throat> the praise team for setting the the table for the presence of God to be in this place. Matter of fact, before they came up to sing, I said, God, would you send your spirit down and fill this place? And I really believe he has answered that prayer. The psalmist David says, better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. Are you happy to be in the house of God this morning? I am certainly happy to be with you this morning. The Lord has given me a message this morning. That is a message of revival. It's far too often we go through the motions of life. And life becomes mundane and monotonous and so does God. And there are many times that we have to go back to the source of life. Would you turn me down a little bit on the mic? I'm going to get loud in the process of the sermon. Somewhat of a passionate guy. But God becomes mundane in the process. And so we have to return to the source of life. Why don't you turn with me in your Bibles and why don't you stand with to your feet with me, um, standing to your feet as we read the word of God, not only for that, but maybe there's someone who has fallen asleep. Well, now you are awake. <laughs> Let the church say amen. amen. Let's wake up this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 63. Psalm 63, the 63rd Psalm of David. If you have your iPhones, you can slide there as well. Psalm 63. It reads, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will, they will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him while the mouths of liars will be silenced. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and tell them, come thirsty. Come thirsty. Let us pray. Not a minute, not another hour. Lord, we come to you thirsty. We come to you 
looking for a word. We come to you with expectancy. So, Father, as we open your word, may our hearts be open to you. Let God's people say, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. There is a word in today's culture that describes someone who has a more than healthy desire to get with someone of the opposite sex. There is a word in today's culture that describes someone that's desperate to be in a relationship. The young people in the audience know what word I'm talking about. There is a word for that guy or that girl that talks to everybody that comes into a building walking on two feet. And the word that today's culture describes that kind of desperation is thirsty. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, the thirst is real, the thirst is real. But to get a more technical and precise meaning of this word, to understand it in its entirety, to to, to understand the vernacular, vernacular that is used in today's culture, I went to a trusted source, UrbanDictionary.com. <laughs> now, parents, if you hear your daughter or your son using a word that's in English that you don't understand the precise meaning, to, don't ask them. They're going to look at you crazy and going to, you're going to show your age a bit. You're going to seem disconnected. So uh, in the future, just go on your computer and Google Urban Dictionary. Type the word and it will give you the meaning of that word. So in, uh, as I went to UrbanDictionary.com and I typed the word thirsty in, it gave me three definitions. Too eager to get something or someone. Desperate for something or someone. Number three, and this definition was, was appropriate. The guy that hits on every last girl in the group. And it even continues to give an example. The example is boy runs up to girl panting and breathing hard. Looks at girl and say, hey, what's up, girl? You're looking real good. Can I get them digits? And girl under her breath says, thirsty. Being thirsty means that you are desperate. You have an almost creepy, fatal attraction-like desire to be with someone of the opposite sex. These are the individuals that we know are desperate. And nobody likes a desperate person. Lift your hands. No, don't. Don't do that. Thirsty means that you're being too intense with your desire to pursue a person, that you're too, desire, you're too desperate and too intense in pursuing a relationship with someone. And thirsty in this context is not good. Being thirsty means you have a desire to pursue a relationship. And in today's culture, Thirst may be used to describe that guy or that girl that has a more than anxious 
and more than overly attentive response to someone that they may like. But in Psalm 63, David thirsts for God. He is desperate for God. He has a longing for God. David, in Psalm 63, thirsty is not a bad word. Because the person that he desires, really, he needs in his life. And there will come a time in life when life does not make sense. There will come a time in life, or maybe you have experienced a time in life, when life does not make sense. And in those moments, we become desperate. We become thirsty. We desire God in our lives. Because many times in our lives, it's when the bottom falls out from under our lives, that is when we become more than thirsty for God. And David finds himself in the same predicament. Life doesn't make sense to David. And David, um, and during this moment of his life, writes Psalm 63. David writes Psalm 63 at the second darkest moment in his life. The first darkest moment being when he lost his son that he had with Bathsheba. And during that time, he comes before God and he pleads to God in the sanctuary, in the temple. He goes before God and says, God, why don't you save my son? Don't allow him to die. But God says, that's the punishment you will receive for taking another man's wife. You not only took the man's wife, but you killed him. But now, now you have to face the consequences of your actions. Does someone understand what I'm talking about this morning? There is such a thing as, as sins of the generations where we are still paying for some things that our grandmothers and our grandfathers may have committed. The darkest moment in his life, maybe you've lost a child and you can relate to David. I don't have a child yet because I'm not married yet. But I'm sure if I were to lose a child, it would tear me up inside. The darkest moment in his life. But David wrote Psalm, at the darkest moment in his life, he wrote the Psalm, Creating me a clean heart, O God, or in your right spirit within me. And at the second darkest moment in his life, he writes Psalm 63. The second darkest moment being when David fled from his own son Absalom who was trying to kill him. He ran through the, the desert of the, of, 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 of the Middle East in the middle of the summer and made his way to the Levitical city of Manaheim. And while he was there, while his, while his family was imploding before his very eyes, while his world was exploding in front of his very eyes, while his world was falling apart, while his life didn't make sense, he penned these words, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because you, your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. In the midst of the storm, David brings glory to God. While he had to pay for his sins, he says, God, I need you more than ever in my life. Psalm 63 displays three separate themes that I believe would be important for us to recognize and understand so that we, as we reach, maybe when we reach these moments in our lives, we can look at Psalm 63. The first one being recognize God's sufficiency. Recognize God's sufficiency. In verse 1, the opening statement says, Oh God, you are my God. 
The English oftentimes does a horrible job in expressing what the author is trying to say. But because I studied Hebrew, I can understand what David is trying to say. He says, oh God, you are my God. The, first, the, the, the word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim. And the first appearance of the word God, Elohim, that we see in the first statement, oh God, that word is in the plural, Elohim. It is plural because it denotes God's triune nature. It denotes the Trinity. They are three in one, and so it is plural. But David does something interesting with the second word for God. It is not in the plural, but it's in the singular. El. It's a singular God attached to a personal pronoun. And so what David was trying to convey through the, to, through the Hebrew language to the readers that were reading it is that he wanted an imminent God and not a transcendent God at that moment in his life. I think many of us don't get it yet. David says, I don't want the triune God. I want a personal God. Oh God, you are my God. In other words, instead of approaching God as a king, where you have to go through formal ways of approaching God, you have to go through, you know how you approach a king, it's formal. But David says, I am desperate right now, and I need a friend right now. I don't need a God. So he says, God, I, you are my God. David says, I need a personal God right now. My world is imploding in front of my very eyes. My life is exploding. It is falling apart. I don't need to approach you. Oh, Father, I come before you. He comes before God and he cries out to God. There's so many times we pray these formal prayers. See, we pray formal prayers when nothing is going bad in our lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. But when we're desperate, we come before God who says, God, I don't know what to do. We're not coming dressed up. We're coming broken down because we are desperate and David is desperate. You see, the thing is, you can't recognize God as a sufficient God unless he is a personal God. You can't talk about God's sufficiency until you've experienced him providing for you. I'm famous for losing things. Anyone that works closely with me and knows me intimately knows I am famous for losing things. Don't give me anything. I lose it. I've lost my car keys. I've lost my wallet numerous times. On one occasion, I actually lost my car. Can you believe that? <laughs> and I remember I was at Southern at Venice University, and it was spring break, my senior year, and I decided to drive to, my, uh, to Orlando to spend spring break with um, some of my friends in Orlando, and um, drove down. You know, spring break was about 10 days. Drove down to Orlando, and um, got there the first day, great. Second day, can't find my wallet. I'm like, where's my wallet? And my money is in my wallet, debit cards, driver's license, insurance cards. I needed that wallet. I was desperate to find that wallet. It was for my survival that I needed that wallet. For three days, I looked for that wallet. Couldn't find the wallet. 
Looked in the apartment, my friend's apartment, couldn't find the wallet. Looked in the car, couldn't find the wallet. Looked outside the apartment, couldn't find the wallet. Looked in the attic, couldn't find the wallet. I looked places that I didn't go to try and find my wallet. I needed to find my wallet. Three days looking for the wallet. You know, I said, you know, I'm just going to give up. So I said, you know, I need to replace the contents in the wallet. So I had to go set up an appointment at the DMV. Took me two hours waiting in line to get a brand new um, license reissued. Uh, I had to go to the bank, get a temporary debit card. I had to call uh, the insurance company and risk management and tell them, hey, can you reissue me a new insurance card? All of this took, uh, took a total of six days just focused on my wallet. Half my spring break was my wallet. So I even got, went to, bought a new wallet, everything. I'm getting ready to leave. The last day. She's into the sermon. I'm getting ready, I'm packing my car. I'm cleaning it out. And wouldn't you know, the wallet is under the front seat. (laughs) Don't you just hate when that happens? Don't you just hate when you you spend all that time and you're freaking out and it was right under your nose. But if God is personal to you, when you've lost him, You'll search for him. If God is personal to you, if his presence, if you sense that he's not alive and well in your heart, you're going to be desperate to find it. You're going to, you, you, you won't be able to hold your sin. You're going to spend days and weeks and months asking God that, God, I need you right now. I desire you in my life because if he's a personal God, you will look for him. If he's not present in your life, if he's not a personal God in your life, you'll do anything in order for him to be in your life because you need him for life. And David is telling his readers as we read Psalm 63 that that my God, my ail, you are my ail God, you are my personal God. And this is why I'm so desperate in searching for you because you are the only God that is sufficient for my problems. See, it's important that we recognize that God is sufficient for us. And the only way for, for, the only way for us to know that and the only way for us to have faith in that, the only way for us to take that to the bank and cash it is if he is a personal God to us. We have to experience God. Number two, we have to desire God deeply. David desired God deeply. This metaphor of thirst that David uses in Psalm 63 is found in only one other place in the Psalms, and that is in uh, chapter 42, verse 2, when David says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. In the entire Psalms, he uses that only twice. He desires and thirsts for God so much that his body aches. If you look in the first verse, David says in the second statement, he says, My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In the Hebrew, that word for longing means my, my body. I, I'm so far away from you that my body aches. I'm in pain because you're not close to me. I'm having withdrawal symptoms. How many of us have withdrawal symptoms when we haven't spent that time with God? How many of us have, or go, go through withdrawal uh, symptoms when we go a couple of days without communicating with God? How many of us go through withdrawal symptoms when, 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 when we have not approached God and we get so busy with life and we, it happens? 
But do we go through withdrawal symptoms? Does our body ache? Does our soul long for God? Because if it's not, it is not, God is not personal in our lives. Do you desire God to the point that you need him to breathe? Because David desired God to this level. Regardless of his sin, regardless of what was going on in his life, regardless of the storms that he was going through, regardless of how he felt on the inside, regardless of his situation, regardless of the punishment he had, he says, God, I desire you more than life itself. We're talking about desire and thirst. So in Jamaica, when I was growing up, I ran track. Surprise. I honestly believe, I honestly believe if I were ever good at one thing in this life, it would be to be a sprinter. I really believe that I would have made it to the Olympics. I mean, I'm not joking. Um, when I was 11, I ran barefooted. Don't worry, I'm in the islands. Um, and I actually did 100 meter in a little bit under 11 seconds. Told you. <laughs> there was talent. I had a natural, smooth running form, my chest up. Legs always high, relaxed shoulders, wonderful technique. It came naturally. <laughs> I will stop gloating now. <laughs> Too bad I can't run like that anymore. <sighs> and so I remember once um, I had to... Uh, you know, check and field day, and um, I ran a race, the 100 meters. My, my, the, my favorite race is to run with the 100 meter and the 200 meter. And I was running the, two, the 100 meter race, and um, I think, you know, I never, got, I never went into a race thinking I was going to lose. I always went in thinking I was going to win. But this, man, this is the only time in my life. Anyway, let me continue the story. So, I start, I, uh, Started uh, the 100 meter, and I'm running, and all of a sudden, the race ended, and I'm fourth. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I came fourth. I have never lost a race in my life. I'm, still to this day, that's the only time I've ever come fourth. Ever. I have a bunch of medals. I did a bunch of competitions. Never came forth. But came forth this one, man, I was so upset. I, I literally cried. Bald. <laughs> like oceans coming out of my eyes crying. Like ugly face crying. I wasn't supposed to lose. What's this? Losing is not an option for me. Came forth. <laughs> I said, this is not ever happening to me again. This is never happening to me again. I went, I, I, I went, went ahead after school. I literally trained for three hours after school. On the weekends, I trained another four hours and got a trainer. Worked on my form worked on, 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 on lifting my knees, did squats for however long I did squats until my legs turned into spaghetti. I trained so hard, but regardless of the pain and regardless of me feeling tired, regardless of me uh, feeling thirsty, regardless of the, the, the arduous task of training, my desire to win over, superseded all of those things. I said, I'm not coming forth ever again. 
remember my trainer went to, um, there's a place in Manchester, Jamaica called Kirkvine. It's called the Kirkvine Invitational. It's, it's put on by a company um, that, that produced aluminum and um, our school was invited. And so we were going up against these other schools. This is after I trained now. And um, everything was timed. I think if you won here, you could then move on to another invitational, and that's how you get into, you know, competition. And so um, I remember we were running the 4x4 four 100-meter four relay. Oh, sorry, 4x100-meter relay. And I got the baton last on the second leg. And I ran so hard, I passed everyone back and come into fourth position, passed my baton, baton on to the, the anchor leg, and then the last leg, he finished it, and we came first. And from that point on, I never lost another race. You see, I became desperate to win because I lost. Not until I was at the back of the race did I become desperate to win. This thirst for God is not something that we can manufacture. It only comes from God. This thirst can't be manufactured by coming to church. This, th ch this thirst can't be manufactured with worship and praise teams. This thirst only happens when the bottom falls out from under our lives and we become desperate for God. Maybe the reason we have not thirsted for God is because we have not seen God as sufficient. The healthier our view of God, the deeper the sense of longing we can experience for God. Only in, 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 in other words, my view of God determines everything about me. My view of God determines everything about me. We can't manufacture this thirst. And many times, it's not until the bottom falls out from under our lives, will we desire God to this level. Our view of God determines everything about us. The healthier our view of God, the more sufficient and the more desirous we become of God. So I remember on one of the many trips I've taken to Universal Studios, this one particular day it was raining. And, um, you know, have you ever been to Universal Studios when it's raining? Everyone goes into the kiddie rides indoors, you know? Um, and so on this particular day, that's what happened. Um, so I went inside one of these rides. You know, everyone's waiting inside. There's a long line of kids, you know, kids talking and a bunch of kid noise. And there was a couple, a family in front of me that was there and... Um, Maybe, I don't know, maybe parents do this, you know. So there were three kids, two girls, one boy. And it seemed like the, the, the mom and dad had, had like a little huddle. And they said, um, how about you take the girls and take the guys and take the boy. And, you know, we try to distract them, try to play with them so, you know, they're a little calm. So let's keep them busy. So they said, huddle break. And so the mom took the two girls and the father took the son. I decided to look on the father of the son. It was the guy thing to do. So I watched the father and his son. So out of all the games they decided to play, out of all the games they could have chosen, they chose rock, paper, scissors. Now, in my mind, I'm like, that wasn't a smart choice. That's going to get boring in less than three minutes. Rock, paper, scissors, three minutes, got boring. And the son said, Dad, how about we change up the game? He started saying, Dad, let's do rock, paper, scissors, superhero. <laughs> and the dad was like, okay. And um, so the dad asked him, how, how do we play this game? Well, the son said, he's about 10, I'm guessing. He's about 10. And um, his son said, Rock, paper, scissors, superhero. If I call a superhero and you call a superhero, we need to explain why my superhero beat your superhero. Okay? Dad said, all right, no problem. 
Now, this is all for the purpose of distracting his son. Of course, he's going to play along. Because, you know, kids, when they're not doing anything, they get hyperactive. So, he plays along with his son. Rock, paper, scissors, uh, the son says Batman. The father says Superman. And the son is like, no, dad, Batman beats Superman. He has no powers and he's still awesome. And, it, and the dad was like, no, Superman is better because he can laser things, he can blow things. You know, he's better than Batman. And so they went back and forth. But his dad actually was into this argument. But his dad, his dad said, I'm not going to let you in. Superman's better. I can tell he's the kind of dad that's not going to allow his son to win at everything. Because he doesn't want his son to leave the house and believe, and comes, comes up with this entitlement thing. Psychological thing that he can win at everything he puts his mind to in life? No. And so for the next three times, they called out several superheroes. The dad kind of cheating, going back to some, you know, old school superheroes, you know. So the son was obviously upset, frustrated. And he said that, dad, next time I'm going to beat you. And dad was like, bring it, son. Bring it. And so... The dad said, rock, paper, scissors, superhero. And his son says, rock, paper, scissors, Jesus. <laughs> so drop the mic, leave the stage moment. They were obviously not atheists. <laughs> and the dad asked his son, why did you choose Jesus? And the son said, because Jesus is bigger than anything. I would submit to you this morning, church, that that boy has a healthy view of God. Because your view of God determines everything about you. You see, his view is healthy and is theologically tight. Because in five minutes when that boy becomes 17, he's going to be in high school. And his friends are going to ask him to participate in activities that he knows is going to get him in trouble. But he's, he's courageous because Jesus is bigger than anything. In the next three minutes, he's going to be in college. And he may be under a professor that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. And the professor is going to ask him, do you believe in Jesus? And he's the only one in the class that's going to believe in Jesus. And he's courageous to stand up for his faith because he knows Jesus is bigger than anything. And when he's 64 years old, knelt over in front of a grave, he buried his wife the week before, and through the tears he will say, Jesus is bigger than anything. Your view of God determines everything about you because your view of God dictates how desperate you will be for Jesus. Do I have any members in the building? My view of God determines everything about me. My view of God determines my worth. My view of God determines my identity. My view of God determines um, how I love. My view of God determines how I deal with anger. My view of God determines how I will deal with difficult times. Because if we believe Jesus is bigger than anything, then no matter what we go through in life, Jesus will be bigger than our problems. That will determine how much we desire God. And lastly, trust God completely. David called out on God because he knew he was sufficient enough. David called out on God because he was desperate enough. But David called out on God because he trusted God completely. David trusted God while his world imploded 
in front of him. Maybe the greatest act of faith, maybe the greatest act of faith is that we worship God through the storm. Maybe the greatest act of trust is that we worship God in the middle of our trial. Maybe the greatest act of faith is to declare God as sufficient when we have nothing. Maybe the greatest act of faith is to stand when we, and look at God when we have no one else to stand with us. Maybe the greatest act of faith is that while we are crying, we're telling God, you're the only one that can comfort me. Maybe the greatest act of faith is walking in dark, even though we can't see anything, and says, God, you will lead me. There's a pastor that once told a story about his wife. Now, I heard the story. The pastor said, um, you know, he got invited to speak for a, um, a camp, six-week camp. And um, he went to this camp and, you know, he said after like four sermons, he kind of got lost about what to say. I completely understand what he means. Um, when you have to preach for six weeks, oh, it's a lot of work. Um, some people don't really realize how much work it takes to put together a sermon. I really want you guys to come and do what I do. It, on average, it takes about 10 hours to put together a really good sermon. Yeah. I should be getting paid more. <laughs> Petition to the conference, yeah. And um, he said um, he woke up, his wife came in and woke him up at 3.33 in the morning. Now, um, and his wife looked at him frantically and says, honey, um, I think I lost the baby. I think I lost the baby. And, you know, her, his two other daughters were in the bed, and um, he took, they, they both went into the bathroom because that's the only place in the house where the door could be closed. And so he went into the bathroom, and they, they were crying together. They were, you know, they were like, you know, what's happening? Are you sure? And, you know, she said, I can't feel him kicking. He usually kicks around this time. And, you know, I, it just feels like, you know, he's dead. And, and, um, and so they, they were in the bathroom crying and hugging each other and praying. And, and so he calls the camp director and tells the camp director um, that he needs to rush to the hospital with his wife. And so as the sun was coming up in the morning, you know, the sun was rising, they were going down the hill to the hospital. You know, they made their way around the corner and went into the, the emergency room. Um, and so... They went into the room with the nurse, and, you know, the nurse pulls off her stomach and then puts that, you know, clear, gooey stuff all over it, you know, just squeeze it all over, you know. And, um, you know, she's then looking for this heartbeat. Can't find the heartbeat. Can't find it, looking for it. And as the nurse was bent over, over his wife, she read the nurse's name tag, and the nurse's name was Miracle. And the wife said, with tears in her eyes, I need one of those today. And the nurse looked at her and says, well, I can't guarantee you any of those today. And the wife says, no, I'm not looking at you to guarantee it. I'm looking at God to guarantee this miracle. And so they're there, and the, 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 the pastor that was telling the story said he was in the corner of the room. He was crying. And he was crying his eyes out and everything. And he says, I'm not an emotional guy. I always, you know, I was crying. And so he said, finally, she found a heartbeat. So they were rejoicing and said, oh, yes, oh, my goodness. And, you know, they were like, you know, sometimes when those moments happen, you, you just want to do everything to thank God. I mean, how many of us have had situations in life where we just, you know, we just, God brought us through the storm and said, thank you, Jesus. And so um, they went ahead and to celebrate and say thank you to God, they went and had Chinese food, you know, ordered an entire cake and everything, 
you know, celebrating. And, and um, as they were waking, making their way up the mountain, as they were making their way, way back up the mountain to the camp, he call, the camp director called the pastor and said to the pastor, how's everything with your wife? He's obviously in a great mood. He says, everything is wonderful. The camp director said, you know what? How about you take the night off? Camp director said, how about you take the night off? And he, you know, in his mind, his, he had a picture immediately going to him, he and his family, you know, in front of the TV, watching a cartoon movie with his family. And before the words could come out of his mouth, wonderful, you've been so gracious, thank you so much. While his wife was looking in the window, she said, no, you ain't. And he, was about, and he said, woman? You see, she, he, he said she wasn't the, she's not the talkative type, she's not outspoken. But for some reason she says, no, you're not. Corpus the phone. Said, honey, um, what do you mean, no, I'm not? She turned to him and said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. She says, as we're going to the hospital this morning, I pray that God, whatever your will is, God, that it be done. If you lose the baby, I'll still praise you. If we have the baby, I'll still praise you. She says, the sun was coming up in the morning. Doesn't the Bible say something about the sun coming up? That our mercies will be renewed every morning? And she says, go ahead and preach the word of God. Because that is what you've been called to do. Regardless of our issues, regardless of our situation, regardless of the trials we just faced or we are facing, in the midst of all that, you are still here to preach the word of God. The greatest act of faith is to worship God in the midst of our storm and tell God that, God, you give and you take away. I will worship you regardless of what comes. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know everyone's story in the room. But somebody in this building today is going through a storm in their life. Someone in this building today, their life feels like a house of cards. Someone in this church today is going through a difficult situation that doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense to you. At this moment, I'm going to, at this time I'm going to ask you, if you're one of those people, would you stand with me? I'm asking you to stand not because you're not going through anything, because you're actually going through something. And like David, you are desperate for God. I know I'm not going to be the only one standing in this room today. But if you're going through something right now, you need God to intervene and you're desperate for God. You're thirsting for God right now. Why don't you stand? All right. See, there are people standing. The word of God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek me. For those of you who are standing, you see these people before you. I'm going to do something very simple. How about we actually turn this place into a house of prayer? So if you're sitting right now, why don't you pray with the people that are standing with you? We're going to pray over you right now. That you will worship God despite the storm. That you'll recognize his sufficiency. That you will thirst for him. That you'll be desperate for him. So why don't you pray with the person next to you. Pray over the people next to you. Whatever it is you're going through. And then after that I will close.
O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, desperately, I thirst for you. Because you are the only one that is sufficient enough for me. Lord, we want to recognize you as our sufficient God. But God, we have a desire for you that is unquenchable, that will never be filled. And God, there are people in this house today, their souls are like dry and thirsty lands. Lord, we want you to water those souls, to water that heart. Lord, we ask that we will thirst for you like we have never thirsted for you before. God, we ask that you will touch us and revive our hearts to love you like the first love we experienced. And God, as everyone has prayed, God, they have prayed for their particular situations. They have prayed for specific issues. God, if they're going through it right now, as they're going through it right now, as they're going through this period of storm in their lives at this moment, that they will praise you anyhow. That the song says, it is well with my soul. Regardless of what goes on outside the ship, it is well with my soul. Lord, we desire you. God, we love you. And we can't wait for you to take us home to be with you. Lord, we thirst for you, God. In your name I pray, let God's people say, amen. amen.